um, or anyone that has joined us. I'm just about to introduce the next speaker. And before that, I'll just give myself a quick introduction again for anybody new here. So I'm Denise Murtha Dunn, a volunteer in the OWASP community and also the OWASP Dublin chapter lead. And I will be moderating this session. So during the next 45 minutes, you will be hearing from Dr. Mateus Madhu, who's going to present to us on quantifiable quality, the new standard of secure code. Um, there will be some interaction in this, and I will let Mateus tell you how to do that, but we will be directing you towards the comment section. For any questions that you may have, please feel free to add questions to the Q&A section, which is in the right of the Hoover of the Hoover app, and I will ask these questions in the last ten minutes. So we're actually going to leave ten minutes at the end for questions. And um, so I'm going to get ready to introduce you now to Mateus. I can see he's come online. So Mateus is not only an industry recognised security expert with a PhD in static analysis, but is the CTO and co-founder of the Secure Code Warrior. Secure Code Warrior aims to educate developers, both new and experienced, on how to develop secure code. Mateus is also a regular on the conference circuit, speaking at conferences such as Black Hat and DEF CON. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to Mateus, and I hope you enjoy the next talk. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me well. Um, so yes, and absolutely, uh, Jeremy is a legend. I can only attest to that. Um, so welcome to the conference. Thanks for having me here. Um, I would like to do it and try something out today. I would like to make the session interactive and use essentially the solution that was pro provided, the Wuhuva um, application. Now, it would be great if, if people can open up the, the, the app and go to the comment section, because during this talk, I would like to ask some questions. Um, and I, I would love to have some answers before I go into, hey, what I found in the research. But first, before we even start, I have a question for the audience. Have you ever, ever eaten something that was unhealthy? And you don't have to drop it into the comments over here in the, in the app, but I'm pretty confident that I know the answer. The answer is yes, right? Pretty much everybody will say, well, you know what? I've he eaten something that was unhealthy, which is quite interesting. Right, you, you know that something is unhealthy and still you continue and you say, you know what, for once, it's okay. So interestingly enough, that's where knowledge and behavior doesn't really line up. You know, the knowledge, you have the knowledge, you know that is something un is unhealthy. Still, your behavior is different. Your behavior is, you know what, for this one time, it, it, it will not matter. You know, we're okay. It's fun. You know, we, we can still do it. All right. If that goes really out of balance, well, um, you, you may have some problems. And that's why, you know, uh, successful dietary programs, they work both on the knowledge and the behavior, because quite often the knowledge is simply there. The knowledge is simply there. It is not in, the, in those programs. It's not telling people what healthy and, and unhealthy is, but it's more working on the behavior and, and trying to figure out why this behavior really exists. Does it have some underlying cause? Um, and also trying to influence that behavior. So trying to influence that behavior with, for example, gamification, a pointing system, put, pointing people in the right direction of trying to do the right thing and living healthy. So knowledge and behavior, they need to line up. My next question, have you ever shipped software you knew had a problem? Okay, you can start dropping answers in, um, in the comment section of the Hova app. Um, I can promise you, your manager is not looking, but that would be a lie. So I know, unfortunately, I know, I know the answer as well, right? Um, there's a lot of people that say, yes, um, I've shipped software that I knew it had a problem. I knew it. So again, the knowledge is there. You knew it had a problem. However, from a behavioral perspective, you said, well, I had to do something. I had to reach a deadline. It must be in production by today and so on and so forth. So your behavior was, or it was not a big problem. Um, so there may be lots of reasons. Again, knowledge and behavior, they do not line up and ultimately you create some habits. Um, 
And, and this is what I would like to address in this talk. In this talk, I would like to go a little bit through knowledge and behavior from a developer perspective and figure out how we are actually creating code today and how we can potentially work on the knowledge and work on the behavior to create better code. So thank you very much for having me over here. My name is Matthias Madu. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Secure Code Warrior. Maybe relevant for, relevant for this discussion is um, back in the day, um, I used to work on, on static analysis solutions. So I have a PhD in application security where um, uh, uh, my main goal was to use static analysis to find interesting things in the code. With my PhD, I moved to the US, joined a company called Fortify, and they were really good at finding problems in code. Um, however, and that's, that's where the th whole thing comes together, right? If you never ever tell a developer how to write code, so the knowledge part over here, well, it's, it's not going to happen. So with that knowledge, we, we created Secure Code Warrior to help and actually educate the developer and be on his or her side in writing secure code. Um, again, Lately, I started to discover, well, even if the knowledge is there, like how can we then still influence the behavior? Because it, it takes two parts. It takes two parts. Um, and that's, that's why I'm here to talk about this, this topic today. Now I really would like to try out the app, and I really hope that people will join me and, and put some thoughts around these questions that I'm proposing. So what do we need to build software? Okay, so I... I from back in the day, I know at, at the OWASP conferences, we, we have a lot of application security people, but we also have a lot of developers that have an interest in security joining the conference. So it would be really, really good to know like, hey, wh what do you think? Like if I say, hey, what do we need to build um, software? I'm not saying secure software. I'm just saying software. What do you need? And I'll give it a couple minutes for people to open up the app and drop some thoughts in there. And I really hope this works out because my entire presentation, I will ask more of these questions. And if I'm not getting any feedback, <laughs> this is going to be hard for me. So please make it easy. Please go to that comment section and please drop some comments in the app. And I hope I can actually see them. I should be able to see them. I... Requirements. Thank you, um, uh, Zal, for putting one thing in there. We have requirements. What else do we need to build software? Tools, <laughs> I love it. Hardware, I love it, Stefan. Thank you, Jeremiah. A software platform. I need one more. Come on, what else do we need to build software? An environment. Thank you, Marco. Runtime. Thank you, Jerem uh, Jeremiah. Third party libraries. Yeah, I, I said software, right? I didn't say secure software. Developers, thank you, Zhao. Exactly right. I'm, I'm super pleased to have seen that answer. So we, if we build software and all fits in those categories, we need people and we need stuff. And one thing that is always very clear to me is if I ask this question, um, and I'm super pleased to, to see that Zhao thought about the developers, but quite often we forget about the developers. We, we forget about there needs to be people that actually build the stuff. And in, um, in interactions with um, uh, uh, people around the world, I feel the exact same thing. Like in conversations, it, it's always about the stuff. It's always about IDE, tools, a lot of these things. It's not bad, don't get me wrong. We need to talk about the stuff because ultimately we put bits and bytes into production, um, but it's not quite often about the people. I'm at the RSA conference right now and Industry-wise, if you walk around on the show floor, you have the exact same feeling. 95% of the, the, the companies out there talk about the stuff. They talk about the tools, everything around um, a building software, but not really about the people. Do we really need to focus on people and, and why? And I'm not going to ask that question over here, but... What is the easiest solution if we do not want to have, you know, if you do not want to focus on people? And unfortunately, that is not having the people at all. And I, I do want to say that. I do want to say that because um, there are still companies that do not invest in, in, in the people. And back in the day, in the 1990s, I, I thought that was a pretty interesting story. There was a Belgian company that was doing really good with software development and helping other organizations, essentially outsourcing their developers and creating more software for, 
um, the um, companies in Belgium. They're doing really well. However, in the 1990s, they said, you know what? We think, we predict by um, the year 2000, software development will no longer be a thing. Everything will be developed by that time. And it will just be, you know, drop and drag and uh, drag and drop. And, and that's going to be it. So they weren't really convinced that, that people were still going to drive software, robots, machines, AI, everything was going to take over. You can see that one happening, right? Um, right now, that company is no longer a, a, a big organization. Um, they failed to miss that point. The one thing that I would like to get across over here is, you know, it's, it's not easy, it's not trivial. There's no silver bullet in creating secure software, but we see definitely the people as the number one um, investment point in your organization where you can say, well, you know what, if we invest in our people, that's gonna drive it. So next question is, I was trying to figure out how much, how much do we know about the people that are creating software, you know? And, and I was digging into some research and, um, a similar thing arose where I figured out that 95% of the studies that I was looking into on how to create secure software was around the stuff, the tools, the technology, everything that has to do with the bits and the bytes. 5%, and I'm calling this unknown territory, it's not entirely true, 5%, it's, it's percentage-wise over here, but a very minor fraction of all the research out there is... Um, around the people. And the research out there, I think is, is pretty much unknown. Like a lot of people do, know, do not know about the research. Stuff that I figured out, I was actually, it was, for me, it was mind blowing. And that's essentially what I would like to do over here. So we've done some research ourselves. I've um, uh, found some research online, some pretty interesting research around um, uh, knowledge and behavior that I would like to present. My next question was, you know what, is that the same in, in other industries? If we think about the people, are, are, are we you know, unique? Are we the same as another industry where the focus is really on the end solution? And the, the way I tried to answer that question is I was looking at certification because I know in our field, there's, there's not a lot of certification going on. Um, essentially, when you come out of uni and you join an organization, well, you are given a laptop, you're given access to the repo, and you can start coding. In other industries, it seems to be way more regulated. If you look at certification for doctors, um, operating airplanes, building airplanes, engineering, the grid, a lot has to do with certification for the people, for the tools, for the processing processes. So it's not only for for the for for what they do, but also for the people themselves. Interestingly enough, when I, when I created the slide, I was like, geez, that's pretty interesting, right? Because slowly but steadily, software came into all of these areas and slowly but steadily, it actually became the heart um, of all of these new areas. It became the heart of the grid. It became the heart of, of gas pipelines, traffic controls, cars, hospitals, everything. Everything became softer, right? And it's, to me, it's actually mind blowing that you have these highly regulated industries where certi you need to have a lot of certifications and slowly but steadily, you know, some unregulated thing like software comes into play. And, you know, the boom is there on the slide. And, and to, to go a little bit deeper on a, on a real example over here, if you think about a pipeline, you know, you think about a pipeline 20, 30, 40 years ago, it is, it is a pipe where you open manually valves and stuff flows, liquid stuff from, from one place to another one. That has changed dramatically, right? From being a whole manual building process to a whole manual operating process today, gas pipelines, all these valves open and close in an automatic fashion. Um, and, and it's all driven by software. It's all driven by software. And maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it was not connected to the internet, but today it clearly is. The colonial pipeline attack is, is one of the most noticeable examples over here where something that was completely manual, completely operated by people, not by software, became today completely operated by the machine, by the software. And what happened over there is, so the Colonial Pipeline, it, it goes from the south of the US and it uh, distributes uh, jet fuel to the east coast of the US. Well, what happened over there is two days before the actual attack, they, are, they already breached and already data was exfiltrated. Um, 
but then they were actually hacked with some ransomware as well. They did pay um, uh, the, the ransom. Uh, it only took a long, long time to decrypt all the machines and to be operational. One of the problems in there is, is you know, SQL injection. It's not the, the only problem in there. It was a collection of unpatched systems and, and unpatched problems that led to this particular problem. But this is only to say, you know, this is how we build software, right? Like we're, we're and I'm sure it was well intended like the colonial pipeline, um, software slowly but steadily creeped in to uh, the operation of that particular pipeline. But ultimately it was then connected to the world. It was not made to be connected to the world. And there's a lot of systems that today were not made to be connected to the world. And that's actually how, how quite often people you know, see their own code, they're like, well, but it's only a little piece of software, it's not going to be connected to the internet. So, you know, quick and dirty, I'm going to hack this thing together, and, and it's going to do what it has to do It's something internal, um, it, it will not be connected to the internet. And you would be surprised how quickly it actually is taken and be exposed to the internet or bits and pieces are taken and be exposed to the internet. All right, let's dive a little bit into the research. And um, again, oh, so let's let's talk about the developer. I'm sorry, let's talk about the developer. So what I would like to do over here, we have knowledge, we have behavior, and that leads to habits. You know, if you put knowledge and behavior together, it leads to habits that a person can act on. Okay, so as you can see over here, what I'm interested in is, is in that middle section. Um, what do we know about the knowledge? What do we know about the behavior? And can we influence that? Or can we at least um, take that into consideration? So it actually leads to better habits so that the person can act on that in a better way. But people on the call will be, well, I know you did some surveys, but I'm a developer as well. Why do you not ask me? And that's exactly what I'm going to do. So what I would like to do, I'm going to, I'm going to, pose a question. I would love to see some answers again on the comment section in, in the app. And then I'm actually going to, to talk about my own experience, how I would act or, or how, would, how I would answer that particular question. And then I would like to go through the results of the survey. Let's go to the first question. What is your top priority when writing code? So please drop some answers into the Wavu app. What is your top priority when you write code? Requirements, be clear about the requirements. Understand what the code is doing. Thank you, Marco, thank you, Zhao. Tests, yep. We're, we're all very biased over here, right? Because we, we are on the space of writing secure code. Clean code. Nice one, Stefan. Data flow. Attack vectors again. <laughs> Thank you, Mikhail. It's not, I'll be honest, um, when I do this presentation um, for a developer crew, these are not my typical answers, <laughs> but they're good answers. Don't get me wrong. They're really good answers. But when developers, when I ask this question to developers, uh, attack vectors is the first time I see attack vectors. This is my answer. My answer would be writing new features and functionality. If I would, you know, and I used to be a developer, but if I would be a developer, I, I would not you know, even even I like the uh, the, the tests over here, uh, Jeremiah, that you answered, but it would not be my top priority. I would not immediately think about uh, uh, tests for me. I would think about new features and functionality. And unfortunately, I would not think about tests. I, sh I should be. Um, if you look at the survey, and this is a survey uh, uh, from, from 1,200 developers. So 1,200 developers um, responded to this particular question and we were able to group then the answers in, in, in buckets over here. The top priority, excuse me, the top priority twice 19% was about code quality, reducing technical debt, application performance. To me, that sounds like we work. And I think that's pretty interesting. Like if, if you look at my answer, I, I would like to work on features and functionality. I would say my answer is like an answer when you come out of university, when, when 
you, you, you know, you want to be a developer, you want to land your dream job, you want to create new features, new functionality, you know, new stuff. I would, you know, I think people would be, I think, disappointed when they come out of university and they say, you know what, all I want to do is rework, you know, that's, that's not, and, and still, I think this, this group of people, um, it, it, it is new developers, but also seasoned developers, well, quite a lot of them, their top priority is making sure that the code is behaving better. There's, there's already code, but they want to do it better. So ultimately, it also means it, it wasn't really, you know, and I know it's an iterative process, but it wasn't really properly developed from the start. More on, on the right-hand side, you know, number three and number five, that's where I really see new work, where I really see new work, like solving real problems, um, new features and functionality. I think that's really what, what the dream job is, right? If you come out of university, if you, if you have an ideal scenario of what um, a software developer is, then I think you land in the, in the three and the five. Interestingly enough, and this is, this is actually pretty big in, in, the, in the responses from this particular group, well, it ranks application security. People said, you know what, for us, it's, it's creating secure code. That is our, our top priority. But that also raises a question um, for me, like, well, if, if they say AppSec, what practices do you, app, you know, associate with secure coding? And I'm pretty confident I will see a lot of answers over here. So in this particular group of people, what do you associate with secure coding? Code review. Love it, Marco. Code smell. Oh, nice. Nikhil. Code review. Code smell. What else? So what practices do we associate with secure coding? Come on, we're in this AppSec group. We need to have more answers than, than test cases. Great. Automated security test. DAST, SAST, the usual suspects. Thank you very much, Jeremiah. I'm happy that somebody points out the obvious in this particular group. Any more things? We have code review, we have code smell, we have test cases, we have automated security tests. So what practices do you associate with secure coding? Threat modeling. Nice one, Andre. Weird, weird corner boundary cases. Nikhil, great. And I, and I know where these answers are coming from. Training for secure mindset. Thank you, Zhao. I know where these answers are coming from because we're, we're, in, we're in this AppSec business, right? And we're, we're thinking about security and it's, it's very interesting. So it, when, when I had to think about this one because I'll, I'll be honest, my initial answers would be very along the lines of, of what's over here. But when I thought about it for a second time, what, I, what, what practices I associate with secure coding, zero trust, thank you, Nikhil. When I thought about it, I was like, well, I can see that, I can see what we need to do, but if you're in the shoes of a developer, I think it is the act of writing secure code with known secure coding patterns. Our company is trying to build secure culture for developers, I love it, right, Zhao? So, um, um, the act of writing code using um, known secure coding patterns. I'll be honest, this was not my first answer. Um, I had to, you know, and, and people on, 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 on this call do not have the time to, to think for 10 minutes about my, my, my question over here. But when I sat back and I was really trying to figure out what I associate with secure coding, I was thinking about, you know, doing the act of doing it and, and, and using the secure coding patterns. When we write a group of developers, when we ask the group of developers, I'll be honest, we had a lot of different answers. And this is, this is only the top, you know, we had a lot of different answers. But let's, let, I try to group them a little bit. So what's in there? If I, if I think about my answer, you know, the act of writing code and, and the act of using secure components, um, that came not as a top, but somewhat in the middle. Okay, so somewhat in the middle, the developers themselves thought about of the act of writing secure code, which I thought would be really, you know, higher if you ask developers themselves. Interesting enough, 22% said, you yeah, know what, it's not my problem. There's this group of AppSec people in our organization. It's in their title. They are application security. Well, probably they should take care of my code. You know, I'm a developer. My, my, 
you know, I need to create features and function. It's not my job to create secure code. We have this group of people, they are responsible. And then, you know, I think um, um, pretty much all the questions or uh, all the answers over here, maybe one more is coming in. Security is everyone's responsibility, including developers. Love it, Nikhil, I couldn't agree more. Um, a, lot, a lot of developers were also thinking about, you know, finding problems in code. If you can see over here, number one, two, five, seven, and nine, it's all about SAS, DAST, scrutinizing, peer code review. I've seen that in the chat as well. Um, it's, it's a lot about, you know, a little bit more after the fact. So if you think about the, the secure coding, the act itself, it is the writing itself. This is more, you know, a little bit after the fact. Yes, I know people want to bring that more in line with um, the development lifecycle itself and give some feedback while you're writing code. But it's still, you know, defining problems in code and giving the feedback. And on number four, and I saw that in the chat as well. So thank you very much. It's thinking about the people. It's thinking about, you know, investing in the people. By the way, I'm, and I'm, I'm not sure if I 100% agree that, you know, it should be the number one over here. Um, I, I think the number one is, is really the act of writing code, but it does make sense to also do something before they write code, where ongoing training, education, awareness, making sure they, they know about secure concepts. Well, and the, that, that, that is in, in, uh, baked in um, uh, with the developer and he or she is able uh, to ultimately then act on the information that, that uh, came his or her way. So what's the conclusion here? I think the conclusion that we draw from all the different answers is that there's like no standard definition of, of what secure coding really is. We feel that developers are maybe a little bit confused what secure coding is from, you know, it's not my problem to, well, it's, it's a tooling problem to, well, we need to do training. And, 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 and a group of people said, yes, it, it is, you know, when we're actually writing code. Which is, which is, I think, problematic. Um, and there's no right answer over here. That, that's even more problematic. What, what does it really mean, secure coding? But making that clear in an organization will, will come a long way. If you make it clear in your own organization of what secure coding means within your organization, I think you will come a long way. Next question. And I, over here, I think, well, there's going to be very little bosses. This is not a presentation for an organization. So do you think that you leave vulnerabilities in your code? And you can answer that question if you want. We can just figure out what percentage wise would, would say yes and no over here from this group of people. For sure. Yes. Even with a group of um, security minded people, I see a lot of yeses, one, two, three, four. Well, maybe people that say no in our survey lied. I don't know. But you know, my answer, and I'll also have a defensiveness in my answer over here. Do I leave vulnerabilities in my code? My answer would be yes. Um, and in my defense, I am actually no longer an active coder. So if I would be given access back to our systems, to our codes, I'm pretty confident I would introduce problems because I'm no longer, uh, I didn't upskill myself in the last couple of years. Um, new things are coming uh, out, new frameworks, new ways of developing code. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis working with one particular language and framework. I actually should not be given access to production systems and creating code because I'm not upskilled anymore. What does our survey say? Interestingly enough, our survey said, said 48% said yes, 19% said, well, it really depends on the project and 33% said no. We thought that was pretty high. We thought that was pretty high and we were kind of unsure about these results. So I actually did a little bit more research and I was trying to figure out like, do other um, you know, pieces of research come to the same conclusion? And I actually found another piece of research over here where the results are very, very similar, where over 50% said, yes, you know what, we do push even vulnerable code into production. 48% said, yes, we actually do it regularly. 31% said, you know, occasionally. So a lot of the self-awareness is there. Don't get me wrong. The self-awareness is there, but it's, it's not good, you know. And the next natural question is, why? Why 
why do we you know leave problems in code why do these vulnerabilities exist in your code um so it'd be great to have some answers here why do we have vulnerabilities in code why do people push stuff into production that they know is is actually pretty bad Any answers? Why do we push broken stuff into production? If that is not known as big bad impact. Okay, interesting one. So it, it depends, you know, over here, time pressure. That is the, mo the most logical one, right? Um, uh, Lewis, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Time pressure is, is, is one that we definitely see quite often. Um, I like your, uh, your, your I like your ones out where you say, well, you know, it really depends. Sometimes it's nitty gritty stuff, and we know it's not 100% perfect, but we just push it into production. False assessment of criticality. Oh, I like it, Lewis. So yes, developers they're not all security experts, and they try to assess it themselves, and they make a false judgment essentially. It's only medium. <laughs> Dependencies have vulnerabilities, Jeremiah's. I like that one. It's a, it's a, it, there's more, more and more. Um, uh, uh, well, the previous talk from Jeremy was pretty much all about the dependencies, I would assume. Um, so there's more and more a, a spotlight on on that particular group of problems. Too many permutation combinations to look at, and not everyone has or has got. Paranoid eyes, lack of automated tools increases load even more. Ooh, that's a, um, a, a pretty, let's say, technical answer. Um, the combinations, okay. So, but that's you're looking from a, from an attacking perspective, uh, Nikhil. Uh, I like that. So, from an attacking perspective, there's too many, too many options for an attacker. The whole idea of well, we need to defend against everything, and an attacker only has to find one problem, and you're done. Lewis, we already have an exception for this <laughs> for this release. I love it. I love the answers. Thank you so much. Thanks for the answers. Um, <laughs> so my answer why I would leave vulnerabilities in code, well, I think for me it's because I do not upskill myself, you know, fast enough in languages and frameworks because um, I have other priorities, in, uh, unfortunately. What does our survey say? Let me try to categorize it a little bit into why do people still, they know they have problems in code, but you know, they still push it out. Um, functionality, they, they prioritize functionality over security. Um, deadline, the timing aspect, I've seen a lot of the timing aspect, although I think there were more funny answers in, in this chat than what we saw in the, in the survey. Unaware, people are just unaware. So working on the, the knowledge part. So over there, it's not really um, a behavioral part, but it's really a knowledge part. The doom mongering one, well, everything is broken. We will never be able to get this right. So all code has vulnerabilities. And the last one is maybe, you know, they're unfamiliar or um, as one of the persons in the chat said, you know what, they, they didn't assess the criticality right enough. Lewis, thank you for that one. You were in, in that, that one fits in there. You know, they weren't able to address it. In any case, I think it's problematic, right? Um, are there any good reasons? I, I think there are not. Next one, I'm, I'm, I'm now I want to switch a little bit more to uh, the behavioral side um, of things. Um, so we were wondering, well, if if they do that, you know, if they commit code and they know it has a problem, um, or they do not know that it has a problem. You know, it's just a, a, a fine commit and, and we're not aware of any problems. It turns out it's a bad commit. Would the time of the day of that commit ins essentially influence the code quality? So what do you think? Do, does the time of the day, if, if you as a developer, if you check in code after, mid say, after midnight, um, will, that have a, has, will that have an influence on your code quality? For sure, Andre, most likely, yes. So you have like two and a half yeses and one after midnight, just push the merge. 
<laughs> when I'm hungry or tired, I'm less diligent. <laughs> well, so actually, Jeremiah, you are very close to the answer, my friend. You are very close to the answer. So first of all, my answer. My answer is I hope it is not because I, 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 I know you developers, you like to work uh, in, in, on irregular hours. So I really hope it does not have an influence um, because otherwise I know we're screwed. The honest truth is we are actually screwed because um, uh, there was some research done by uh, Eolfsen and he figured out that, or she figured out, I'm sorry, I do not know, he or she figured out that the, the, the uh, code commit that is problematic is very closely aligned to our um, circadian rhythm. So essentially what, what you're saying over here, Jeremiah, is when I'm hungry or tired, is it essentially comes very close to your natural behavior. So your natural thing, uh, your natural body behavior on a day-to-day -day basis, which means that, hey, your, your peak activity is between uh, 10 and 2 p.m. You do have a, a, an afternoon dip between 2 and 4 p.m. And then between 4 and 10 p.m. It, it's still okay, but it still goes down. And if you do stuff after midnight, well, actually don't do it. it it's, it's not good. Your, 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 your consciousness, everything is like close to zero. And, and um, this particular piece of research, they figured out that it actually is very closely related. Developer experience, does that influence code quality? And I have to be a little bit more careful here what that means or what we mean with developer experience. Um, what, what the research looked at is the number of commits to the repository or the components, meaning you know, if you're a regular committer, we think you are more experienced. So that's, that's how we quantify you as more experienced. And also the time of your first commit. So did, did, are you there from the start or uh, did you come in fairly late into the, into, the, into the project, into the code base? So that's how we define you know, code um, uh, developer experience. So do you think it influences your code quality? Um, Yes or no, do you think it influences the code quality of your code? If you're an experienced developer by these particular um, measures. Any takers? So does developer experience influence, experience influence the code quality? Marco says not necessarily. Zhao said, yes, the complete opposite. Marco, I think you, you, you mean that maybe our, our initial criteria for, for defining developer experience are, are off. Jeremiah, so yes. More commits might lead to more <laughs> problems. <laughs> that is true. Let's let's take it percentage wise. Zhao. So more more commits means you can actually make more problems. <laughs> my ex my my answer over here to this particular question is: I really hope it does. I really hope there is research that points out that there is a correlation between a good developer um, and essentially less problems and creating less problems in code. I'm sorry, one, so one more from Marco. Someone with more experience in other projects may still provide better code on the first commit in a new project. That's an interesting perspective, uh, Marco. Um, well, the reason I bring this up is because I think this was very decent research. This, this was really you know, done on, on something, something substantial. It was done on the, on the Microsoft and it was done on the Linux kernel and Postgres where they did find actually a correlation between um, uh, what they call drive-by developers. If, if you have a drive-by developer that just makes one or two commits um, very irregularly, well, then there, the likelihood of, of having a, a problematic commit is higher than a person that is quite often in the code base. And, assess, uh, and also, if that person is there from the start, so even if he or she is not committing quite often, but if he or she is there from the start, well, they essentially make less problems. So great, there is a correlation between um, um, a developer that is experienced and the influence on the code quality. Now you may ask the question, but one second, why, why are you telling this? How, how does this help us? You know, well, in my view, I, I think 
with these questions, if we can work with the answers on how developers see secure coding, um, on how, how you're coding on a day-to-day -day basis, if, if time pressure, if there is actually research that says, you know what, um, um, time pressure is, is, a, is a problem for developers and they create more problems if you ask them to work late nights and the code really needs to be done. Well, we need to create a better environment for developers as well so that they can thrive, so that they can have the knowledge and we work on the behavior so that essentially we create better habits. What happens if you do something like that? Well, actually, if you do something like that, and we, we did something, we, we worked on the knowledge, so we, we upskilled 5,000 developers, but we also worked on the behavioral part where we incentivized them and we actually gave them time to upskill themselves. Well, if you get these two bits and pieces in line, well, you can actually do a lot of things. You can actually eradicate recurring vulnerabilities in code from the start. Um, it's not with tooling, but this is with people. What you do is you upskill, you train an entire organization, but also you work on the behavior part, and then you can actually book some real successes. Quick question. What happens with the number of vulnerabilities after your developers care? Do you think it goes up or do you think it goes down? If you're the... Should be an obvious one, right? So what happens with the number of vulnerabilities? after your developers care. Jeremiah's, it goes down. I think that's everybody, everybody's answer, right? Everybody will hope that it goes down, even myself. My answer would be it goes down big time. Well, we had one customer that said it goes up, but then it goes down. So, um, and the reason is pretty interesting. Um, when your developers care, they start to care more about the code and they start to realize that they either made mistakes themselves and while they're not always able to immediately fix that particular problem, they can still open a bug or open a ticket and make sure it's in the system so it can be handled. Or they can actually spot problems in code um, that are there, not made by themselves, but because they've learned, they spot problems in code that they're working on and they're going to file these, these problems. So initially it goes up, but then, yes, it does go down, luckily. But when I was working on this particular slide, I was like, well, you know what, what but, but well, you know, why do they find them? Doesn't the SaaS solution find all these problems? You know, I, we thought there's plenty of, plenty of tools in place. Why does it, is it still possible to go up? But SaaS solution should find all of this. So my next question. If, if, for the people on this call, how, what percentage of vulnerabilities do you think are found by a SaaS solution? Jeremiah's 25%, 40 to 50%, 50%. It goes up. I'll give you my answer. I thought it was even more than 50%. So this is the range from 25 to 50%. I thought it was 60%. And I have a, a reasoning for that. My best guess was 60% because back in the day, I did a research project where we used the SaaS solution and we used the DAS solution. And what we were after was the overlap between the SaaS and the DAS solution. And we saw that there was very minimal overlap between the SaaS and the DAS solution. They essentially found different problems in code. So let's say you find 100%. And if there's a small overlap, which means, you know, Every, every tool find a little bit more than 50%. So my, my reasoning is, you know what? It's going to be 60%. That is not entirely true. Um, I found some research that, that they did um, where they said, you know what? Only 14% is found by a SaaS solution. And interestingly enough, in that research, they claimed that um, the combination of different SaaS solution gives you a very high percentage. Every SaaS solution seems to be engineered in a little bit of a different way and they find a little bit of different problems in the same code base. And I thought that was pretty interesting. To me, it actually proves that, you know, we will not get away out with, with, with tools and throwing more tools at the problem will not necessarily help. We need to make sure that we essentially invest in the people as well. So ultimately, I'm right on the 45 minutes. Oh, thank you, Zao. I'm sorry, I didn't see your, your 80%. Um, but I have to very much disappoint you with the 80%.
So ultimately, I think it's it's creating an environment. It's creating an environment where our developers can thrive and our developers, you know, or do first of all have access to the knowledge and they're able to up, upskill themselves. They're able to train themselves. They're able um, to know about these frameworks and how to use these frameworks. But at the same time, we have to make sure the behavior is there as well. Um, time, certification, opportunity, incentive. There's a lot that we can do with this piece of research um, that where we can create a better environment for the developer. Maybe last but not least, um, I, I do think I, I touched lightly on certification throughout this, certifi throughout this presentation. Other industries are doing it. Um, I do think certification is coming our way as well. Um, there's more and more incentives to do certification and to make sure that we can prove ourselves and say, hey, you know what, we know what we're doing. We know what we're doing. Um, we can handle this. Um, we can be a critical piece of other industries and make sure that these industries do not go down because of the software. Last but not least, um, I think from an application security perspective, I think ultimately we need to be where the developer is. Um, the developer already has a system, has an IDE. Um, so the behavioral aspect, we have to make sure that from a security perspective, we are more and more closer to the developer and we work with the tools and the systems um, on where a developer is on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that's the only way we can win. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's definitely creating that environment, but our environment should be essentially their environment. With that, I would like to leave you and I've asked a lot of questions during the presentation. So now it's time um, for all of you on the call to ask me some questions, if there are any. Hi, thanks for that. Great. Mateus, that was really interesting. I am going to just look in the tool now to see if there's any questions in the Q&A. Just a reminder to everybody, um, you can enter in questions in the Q&A section within the Whova app. Um, it's separate to the chat or the comment section that you've been using just to interact with Mateus there. So. Oh, I, oh so I see one in the comment section, to be honest. Okay. Uh, did you include the false positives in your analysis? Ooh, that's a great that's a great question. So, by the way, um, um, in your analysis, so when when we did our research, the way I came up with the sixty percent, so yes, we did look into that. Um, in the other research that I'm referring to, uh, they they did go through the um, the results. So yes, there was some um, normalization. I'm, I'm not sure how to call that, but they they did look into the results and they made sure that uh, they read out the false positives. That's good to know. I have a question here. So do you think a more rigorous approach, especially in the areas where the company is regulated, um, should occur when it comes to ensuring that developers are trained in secure development? I think it's coming right. I, I, I'm, I'm convinced there's going to be more and more of a need um, in that area. Uh, my philosophy has always been that developers really want to do the right thing. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to 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 provide them uh, with with the right thing at the right time at the in the right place. Um, I do see more and more university programs embedding secure coding and and the act of creating secure code. I don't think we're quite there yet, but it's already earlier in the process that developers um, get in touch with, hey, you know what? People can misuse my code. They can do things with my application that I did not intend to be there. And oh my God, it has security implications. Um, but what I've always, and I've always believed and, and I'm always convinced that developer wants to do the right thing on a day-to-day -day basis. It's only a, a matter of knowledge and behavior, making sure they know what to do, but also making sure the, the, the environment they're working in allows them to do the right thing. Agreed on that. Um, another question that has just come through is, what is the trend? Is it getting better over the years when it comes to the number of vulnerabilities found in software? Uh, ooh, there's a couple of ways I can answer that question. Um, one trend that we see is um, 
the notion of a baseline. So where a static analysis solution is present and it only goes up. So at a certain point in time, they realize, oh my God, we do not have to introduce more problems in code. So from that point in time, they, they stick with the baseline and they make sure that it's, it's, it's not getting any worse. Um, however, they also realize, well, you know what, it's not getting any better in a sense that we're not reducing our, our risk profile because existing problems are still there and nobody is tackling the existing problems. And, and to, to tackle that particular problem, I, my philosophy over here is um, application security isn't able to do that. We're, we're, we're still 2% of versus the developers. So two application security people per 100 developers. My philosophy is how can we bring the 100 developers on the journey? How can we work with the 100 developers and have a portion of security skilled developers, security champions in these 100 developers? And, and, and that's how I think we can get out of the problem. So is it getting any better or any worse? Um, I'm convinced it's, it's, it's going better. I'm convinced it's going better because we're working on that baseline and we want to reduce the baseline. And we're thinking about bringing the, the developers on the journey. And I think that is a key to success because these people write the code, you know, as application security folks, we can, we can give hints, we can give them information, we, give them, we can even give them training. But if they're not convinced, if, if, they are, if they do not believe in it, if they do not want to do it, it's not, it's not going to work. So we need to bring developers on the journey. And I, th I think it's going in the right direction. That is good to know. Um, another couple of questions that have come in, I'm going to put these two together. So it's saying, what are some of the most important subjects you would teach developers about secure coding? And then how would you track or see improvement from these trainings with regards to secure coding? Would you use a tool or something similar? Okay, great, great. So, so, so first question, um, uh, for, so first part of the question, we really need to train developers in something that is relevant. I think it does not make sense to give a high level video on like, hey, you know what people can misuse and there's things like SQL injection and you need to use parameterized queries without going into the details. It, it has to be very relevant to the technology that we're using, the language and framework that they're using. Um, but also even within the language and framework, if you do not have a database, it's irrelevant to teach people about SQL injection. So we need to tell them stuff that, that is relevant for, for on, on their day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that was your first question. Your say, oh, your second question was around um, uh, impact in improvement. That is a very tricky one. Let's, you know, it is a very tricky one. And in general, in application security, it's, it's a very tricky one because um, even for SaaS solutions, for example, number of vulnerabilities, well, is that, is that, do you have better code? Is 10 vulnerabilities good? Is 20 good? Is one good? You know, you have no idea. Like finding more problems is, is not the end goal of, of a static analysis solution. Um, the end goal of us as a security industry should be to ship reliable code fast that should be our objective and and not find as many problems as possible in code but back to the roi piece how how can you prove roi there's there's a couple of ways we can do it although they are non-trivial you know they're definitely non-trivial um my 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 favorite one but also most difficult one is you do a static analysis scan first then you roll out a training program based on um what you see in the static analysis scan. And then you do another static analysis scan a year later. And what we see is that there's a, a, a significant reduction in problems in these categories that you said, hey, you know what, we're gonna make sure and we're gonna upskill people in those areas. It is a non-trivial exercise, why? Because um, it, it has to be driven by the organization itself. There's not one tool or one solution that can do something like that. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And somebody has just requested that you, could you show the last knowledge or behavior overview slide again? I'm not sure how far back that is on your deck. <laughs> knowledge and behavior. I'm not sure which one, this one? I will say the yes, recap? it's the last one. The recap. The recap. <laughs> yes, that's, if, it's, if, it, if that's not the right one, whoever posted that question, please feel free to add a reply in. And then two other questions that are ah, pretty okay. similar. So, 
so by the way ping me if if you want to you know have a have a copy or whatever of of um what i've shown so for people that are interested in, in stuff uh, feel free to also uh, reach out to me over linkedin or email great that was my next question actually <laughs> because somebody had actually asked how can they get a key summary or key message from this session and also somebody has asked about do you have a list of secure coding patterns that you could share who uh, reach out to me. So we're, we're working on something internally. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if we published that, but so the person re asking that question can definitely reach out to me. Um, okay. We're working on something. In, so we did some work in Java around secure coding patterns, classification. Um, that, that's just our research. There's stuff out there as well. So it's, it's of course not the only, only piece of research out there. Okay, and then the last question just before we let you go is, um, do you think that trained secure coding developers should focus on building secure application frameworks um, to develop secure code without uh, another developer yeah. having to know about security? <laughs> I, so, so, so this may be counterintuitive, but if you can fix it with a framework, um, uh, change absolutely you know there's no reason to to teach people about a certain thing if it's actually resolved in the framework so the more we can do in frameworks the more we can make our framework secure the better the unfortunate truth is well it's really hard to switch frameworks and we have plenty of legacy code that we're still building on top of we never start from scratch unfortunately we're building stuff on top of broken stuff on top of broken stuff so please, by all means, if we have better frameworks, if we can make a framework change to eradicate a category of problems, um, I'm an absolute fan of that because there's already plenty of stuff that a developer needs to learn to, to, to create code on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, and by the way, it's not only about security, but it's, um, it's about performance. It's, it's about plenty of other things that they need to take into consideration to build secure code, to build code, to build quality code. Thanks for that. Um, and I think that's it for Q&A. Just wanted to say on behalf of OWASP, thank you very much for your taking the time to speak to us today. It was a really enjoyable and interactive talk, and I think the audience also enjoyed it.